Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this Red Gaming Tech com video we're going to be discussing as well as analyzing tech news which as usual has popped up in the past 24 or so hours hopefully you are having an amazing day despite the fact it's sunday there is an awful lot of news for us to get through so let's jump in with amd specifically a supposed release date for both the next generation of rdna cards and also the next generation of Ryzen processors. This is according to Chip Hell, where a well-known poster there, Zhang Zhonghao, hopefully I pronounced that correctly, uh, states that these products will launch in October. Now, this individual has been accurate in the past, but of course, things can change here. And given the <coughs> that's uh, affecting the world, we all know what I'm talking about, but I can't say it because YouTube are being, well, really weird with the whole situation uh, with that word. Um, it's possible that products can be delayed. So I would say that even if this information is accurate, it could perhaps end up slipping anyway. AMD's own verbiage when it comes to the release date has been a little bit wishy-washy. They've not provided an exact release date, only insinuating that it's going to be the latter part of this year. And it kind of seems like they were talking like the end tail of the year. Um, and so a lot of people were kind of speculating November-ish would be a pretty good period. December would probably be a bit late because obviously with Christmas at that point in the holiday season, it can be a little bit March and yeah, November would probably be a more logical time for them to launch the products. But October kind of matches this time frame as well. And rather interestingly, there's a separate posting, and this actually slips into some NVIDIA stuff as well as AMD, uh, from the uh, board PTT.cc. And a well-known leaker, Aquarius Z, actually states that 2020 Q4 is going to be a very interesting time because apparently Ampere, or the next generation of NVIDIA cards, will not launch until that point. Basically, NVIDIA is waiting to see what happens with AMD's big Nave cards. And this is not the first time that we've heard this, of course. Just very recently, Kitty Corgi on Twitter actually states, according to their sources, that we will see these uh, GPUs launch in the latter part of this year, Q4. And basically, NVIDIA are essentially waiting for AMD to make the move. And this actually matches what I've heard through the grapevine as well, that AMD actually surprised NVIDIA a little bit. Um, you may be aware that I originally leaked that uh, internally, AMD are calling Nave 23 the NVIDIA killer. And supposedly, NVIDIA now are getting a little bit nervous because of the specification. Now you have to remember, nervous does not necessarily mean that NVIDIA are worried that they can't compete with AMD. Instead, it means that what they originally thought they could release in terms of specifications, they may feel that they have to bump up. So, for example, they may feel that they need to go with uh, faster memory clock frequencies or maybe cut the number of CUDA cores uh, less, uh, less compared to what they originally were going to do for some of the lower end SKUs and so on and so on. And maybe another thing as well is hopefully we will see better pricing for the next generation of products. Ultimately, I maintain what I've said previously several thousand times now this year and also a lot of next year is going to be very formulative when it comes to what we expect from gaming. And this is not just stuff like, oh, faster frame rates, but I think we're going to finally see a really big push for stuff like uh, ray tracing. And I think AI is going to drastically improve as well, especially with the next generation of consoles and obviously significant upgrades to the CPUs, which obviously means you can have much more complicated uh, game logic, AI, and so on. But I also believe that the next generation of consoles plus... Um, just overall, the prevalence of SSDs now in PCs, obviously, uh, SSDs are becoming a lot cheaper. I think that we are going to start seeing game designers kind of radically ap approaching games differently. I don't think that's necessarily going to be the case on the first couple of uh, waves of games for the consoles. I think that this is going to take a while. 
but I do believe that developers, because of the additional processing power of the consoles, plus uh, consoles finally joining us in the 21st century and actually having fast drives, uh, which means I.O. is not such a big deal anymore, I believe that that will mean that game worlds are going to become a lot more interconnected. And that's really cool to me. I think larger, more open worlds is obviously great for me as someone who is more interested in single-player immersive experiences. But as always, we can only wait and see what these games actually look like. And that, to be honest, is the key for me. I am really excited about the next generation of consoles and graphics cards and all this other stuff. Uh, because, well, shiny and cool. But I just at this point want to know more than just like, oh, well, the games themselves look a little bit shinier. I want to see what it actually brings in terms of gameplay. Anyway, uh, we're going to also cover a very quick piece of news for Intel, and this actually is kind of cool. Um, and it was discovered by Tim Apisak. Uh, he found an entry on the Sifsoft Sandra database. Try saying that five times fast. And Tim Apisak has discovered an i3-10100, which is, of course, part of Intel's upcoming Comet Lake range of processors. It's an i3. And while generally gamers would scoff at an i3 and say, well, it's not really indicative of high-performance gaming, is it? Well, this particular processor could be a really nice budget uh, CPU, depending on the pricing that Intel decides to charge. Uh, because essentially this processor looks quite close to what you would expect from an i7-6700K. In fact, it actually um, is not much different at all. So what we have here is a boost frequency of 4300 MHz and a base frequency of 3600 MHz. And it still has the same core configuration as well. Four cores, eight threads. As I mentioned previously, Comet Lake has hyperthreading in just about every single SKU. So this is pretty much uh, identical to the 4200 MHz boost of the 6700K and a 4 GHz base. So what we have here is a boost frequency which is slightly higher, but a lower base frequency. The caveat though is of course with the 6700K, you can overclock the processor. I honestly would really love for Intel to release an overclockable version of this SKU. A 10100K would be awesome for a gaming processor for people who don't want necessarily to do anything else they just want a game and yes i know i know the 3600 is a really good value cpu especially now that amd have officially cut the prices and that's kind of my point here would be a really easy win for intel to release a couple of SKUs which have a decent number of threads at a high clock frequency imagine if a 10100 could hit, let's say for the sake of argument, with overclocking 46, 4700 uh, megahertz, because obviously the silicon quality would be less, and because silicon lottery and obviously binning and blah blah blah. But the point is, it would be a really nice processor, and I think it would be a really nice win for Intel. The other issue that Intel have, which I would really like to see fixed in the future, is uh, the way they've kind of. Um, separated their platforms and I would like some uh, overclocking functionality in the Neon Z 490s and I technically know that some boards or some platforms you can overclock using uh, base clock essentially but that's still pretty limited. I would like some limited um, multiplier overclocking options. Even if it's let's say not as robust like you can't adjust uh, all of the different ratios and all that stuff, even if it's quite limited. Just a small tweaking opportunity for the lower end boards so that people could buy, let's say for the sake of this video, a 10-100K with an appropriately cheap board. And I think that uh, that would be a really nice uh, win for Intel in terms of gaming. Um, as it is though, this is still a pretty cool processor 
but obviously uh, owners of the 6700K will still have a better CPU simply because of the overclocking functionality, but still, this is a pretty cool processor, at least in my opinion. And now we're going to move over to something regarding the Xbox Series X. As a rather interesting discovery has been made on someone's LinkedIn profile. People tend to get rather, let's say, um, pushy when it comes to, of course, their work experience. And are very happy to sometimes accidentally reveal a little bit too much about projects they have been working on. And LinkedIn is sometimes a really good uh, place to find data about upcoming products. And a chap uh, has, I won't give his uh, full name here, but uh, Ashish, I hopefully I'm pronouncing that name correctly, I apologise if I am not, uh, has actually provided some information regarding the Xbox Series X's uh, APU, who is the lead verification of one of the most complex socks uh, to support future gaming consoles. He also managed a team of over 100 engineers across different geographies. And I won't read out all of this, but his responsibilities include primary customer interface to Microsoft. The SOC ASICs consist of multiple CPU clusters with multiple CPU cores in each cluster using x86 and ARM cores, full graphics engines, and the latest 7nm technology process. And a major challenge of this role is to make sure deliverables with 10 IP teams make the SOC requirements, and you can read the rest yourself. So, credit to Blue is Violet on Twitter for this discovery. And immediately, people have started to explode and wondering, what the hell does this mean? Does this mean that ARM is uh, somehow assisting uh, with the x86 processors in running game code and honestly um, a lot of this stuff of course is very ambiguous like multiple CPU cores it doesn't even say how many CPU cores there are although Microsoft themselves have confirmed that there's eight uh, CPU cores um, present which are x86 they're based on the Zen 2 architecture of course uh, we do know the TFLOP amount of the uh, Xbox Series X, but of course we don't know how many compute units it's got, and so on. So there's definitely some uh, questions still regarding the uh, Xbox. I've actually gone deeper into um, the Xbox's uh, architecture and a lot of stuff on TFLOP, so if you haven't seen that video, I'll link uh, the appropriate thing in the description of this video. So I just want to manage a few expectations here. When it's referring to multiple CPU cores in each cluster, that statement itself is a bit ambiguous. So it could be referring to cluster of x86 and ARM, and I'll get into ARM in a moment, or it could simply be referring to how CCXs of Zen 2 function. Basically, uh, CCX is four CPU cores, and then two of those come together to form the chiplet or the whole, which is of course up to eight CPU cores, and then they share level three cache and everyone has a party. As for ARM, this is also not particularly a big deal. Indeed, Ryzen CPUs even use very similar. They've got an ARM processor which actually deals with security. Um, and that of course means that only signed, um, sorry, uh, basically non-malicious code is running on the processor, and this is a particularly big deal for um, professional-level Ryzen processors like Ryzen Pros, and also Epics as well. They've got a secure processor in them as well. Furthermore, don't forget that when it comes to the consoles, you typically want to have some type of security measures so that people don't do naughty stuff. And naughty stuff, of course, means playing backups of games, or even in some ways just exploiting the console, like, for example, running unsigned homebrew. And we know that uh, in terms of the hacker community, there have been an awful lot of really awesome projects that have been homebrew. Like, for example, the original Xbox has its media player. The Xbox 360 as well was eventually kind of taken advantage of and some really cool stuff. The PlayStation 3, a naturally very similar thing there. It's one of the reasons that Microsoft patched out um, other OS installs, but of course we all know how that eventually panned out for Sony. Basically, 
um, console manufacturers the best they can like to retain, um, let's say, control over their uh, respective systems. So basically, all consoles have some type of ARM uh, processor on them, which will essentially make sure that the uh, console itself uh, is only executing assigned code and make sure that you're not doing anything naughty. And furthermore, uh, consoles also have uh, needs which are not necessarily high performance needs. So these could be everything from background downloads all the way to um, being uh, active if, let's say, it needs to download an update for a game while your system is off. Uh, the PlayStation 4 even had a uh, ARM processor which was separate with its own uh, amount of memory. I believe, I might be wrong, but I believe it was 256 megabytes of uh, DDR3 memory. And that would handle things like uh, background downloads, but it would also handle other things as well, such as in general background management. So does this mean that the Xbox Series X's chip is not very impressive or not amazing? No, um, it's basically what we kind of expected, that there would be some type of secondary processor on the, uh, well, processor, to help with this type of stuff. So it's not uh, anything that's not super expected, to be honest with you. Um, and you can actually do quite a bit of reading, if you would like, uh, by simply Googling, or Googling excuse me, around um, uh, AMD ARM processor, and uh, you can kind of read up quite a few bits. And this is also, of course, even present on the uh, uh, APUs as well. But with all of that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. Normal stuff if you did. Like, share, comment and subscribe. And if you have enjoyed the video, you can also find us on social media, which is, of course, linked in the video description. And you can also find Amazon affiliate links. So if you need to buy a product and you fancy giving us a small kickback, if you use one of those links, it would be highly appreciated. But I'll let you all go. Take care of yourselves. Have an amazing day. Bye for now.